Hello everyone, today we're going to discuss one way global climate change has affected the Earth's oceans. So let's jump right in. In the previous video of this series, we discussed the evidence indicating that the Earth is indeed warming and that humans are largely responsible for it. Now, we're going to look at one way anthropogenic climate change is affecting the world's oceans. Of course, the most obvious way climate change is affecting oceans is through raising their temperature. Many organisms that can only inhabit cooler waters will likely go extinct as they are unable to adapt quickly enough to the rapidly rising Earth temperatures. For example, coral are already being negatively affected by global warming. Corals often have endosymbiotic relationships with a genus of dinoflagellates called Symbiodinium. According to the 2007 paper, Coral Reefs Under Rapid Climate Change and Ocean Acidification, quote, Symbiodinium traps solar energy and nutrients, providing more than 95% of the metabolic requirements of the coral host, which is consequently able to maintain high calcification rates. When temperatures exceed summer maxima by 1 degrees to 2 degrees Celsius for 3 to 4 weeks, this obligatory endosymbiosis disintegrates with ejection of the symbionts and coral bleaching. Bleaching and mortality become progressively worse as thermal anomalies intensify and lengthen. Indeed, mass coral bleaching has increased in intensity and frequency in recent decades. At the end of the International Year of the Reef in 1997, mass bleaching spread from the eastern Pacific to most coral reefs worldwide, accompanied by increasing coral mortality during the following 12 months. Corals may survive and recover their dinoflagellate symbionts after mild thermal stress, but typically show reduced growth, calcification, and fecundity, and may experience greater incidences of coral disease." Close quote. As coral reefs suffer, people suffer in turn. Many low-income and developing coastal communities are dependent on coral reef tourism and thus have a very low capacity to respond to climate change. Coral reefs in the United States and Australia generate billions of dollars per year from tourism, and the industry is already being affected by coral bleaching. Additionally, aquaculture is impacted with regard to both fishing and the aquarium hobby. With fewer places for fish to inhabit coral reefs, fish population density declines, impacting the availability of food. Global warming can also affect ocean chemistry. For example, the greenhouse gas methane is trapped in ice in the ocean, and deposits containing this gas are only stable in permafrost and in the deep oceans. As ocean temperatures raise, this gas will be released where it can make its way into the global carbon cycle, increasing the Earth's temperature further. Indeed, we could do an entire video just on the effects of ocean warming, but now we turn to ocean acidification and its effects. As you might expect based on the name, acidification is the process of lowering pH, in this case the pH of the oceans. Remember from the previous video that greenhouse gases, largely carbon dioxide, are being pumped into the atmosphere through various anthropogenic means, cars, factories, etc adding to the carbon that natural cycles were acclimated to. That has consequences, and it's based on physics. Carbon dioxide can dissolve into the oceans, where it becomes carbonic acid, H2CO3. It does this in us, too. Carbon dioxide is produced via cellular respiration, that process that generates most of our cellular energy, and is excreted into the bloodstream. Carbon dioxide combines with water to become carbonic acid, and from there, our red blood cells use the enzyme carbonic anhydrase to convert the acid to bicarbonate, HCO3, and a hydrogen ion. Once the bicarbonate and ions reach the lungs, the reaction is reversed, and carbon dioxide, as well as some water, is expelled when we exhale. Likewise, when carbon dioxide dissolves in the oceans, carbonic acid is produced. It has been well documented in recent years that oceanic pH is dropping. That is, the oceans are acidifying. According to the 2009 paper, Ocean Acidification, the Other CO2 Problem, quote, Since the 1980s, average pH measurements at the Hawaii Ocean Time Series, the Bermuda Atlantic Time Series Study, 
and European Station for Time Series in the ocean in the eastern Atlantic have decreased approximately 0.02 units per decade. Close quote. If the oceans drop below 0.6 units, then ocean pH will have dropped lower than at any other time in the past 300 million years, barring natural catastrophes. For those of you who need a refresher, solutions are considered basic if they have a pH of 8 or above, solutions are neutral if about 7, and solutions are acidic if 6 and below. Yes, some solutions are so acidic that they have a negative pH. Water containing high concentrations of sulfate from certain mines can be as low as negative 3.6. And surprisingly, archaea, living organisms, have been found inhabiting waters of pH 0. The oceans, though, are slightly basic, possibly due to the buffering effects of compounds like calcium carbonate, which is somewhat basic. Very, very many biogeochemical processes are going on in the oceans simultaneously, a churning flow of water layers and the chemistry with it, so researchers are still trying to work out what the exact reason for ocean basicity is. Importantly, though, many aquatic organisms utilize calcium carbonate, from certain algae and protists to coral to mollusks to echinoderms. They make the calcium carbonate, and when they die, it is either dissolved or deposited in the sediment. The 2004 paper, Impact of Anthropogenic Carbon Dioxide on the Calcium Carbonate System in the Oceans, points out that as the oceans take in more carbon dioxide, more carbonic acid is formed, decreasing the amount of carbonate in the oceans. Numerous studies have shown that as oceanic carbonate levels decrease, the ability of organisms to calcify also decreases. The reason is that calcium carbonate structures become more susceptible to dissolution unless the surrounding water is saturated with carbonate. For starters, coralline algae are rhodophytes that play a major role in reef building. They are characterized by being very tough due to calcium carbonate deposits in their thallus. Experimental work such as the 2008 paper, Decreased Abundance of Crustose Coralline Algae Due to Ocean Acidification, has shown that as the oceans acidify, coralline algae will have a more difficult time with both recruitment and growth, and will likely be replaced by fleshy algae, changing the dynamics of how reefs are built. Next, as Donald Prothero points out in Evolution, What the Fossils Say and Why It Matters, phytoplankton, such as foraminifera and coccolithophores, are the largest producers of atmospheric oxygen. These organisms, too, are affected by increasing ocean acidity. The 2020 paper, Decadal Variability in 20th Century Ocean Acidification in the California Current Ecosystem, documents that forams are becoming less calcified as a result of ocean acidification. The direct linkage between foram shell thickness and ocean carbonate saturation allows for the tiny protists to be used as proxies for carbonate saturation in the past. And it's not just California. That shelly protists are becoming thinner globally as a result of ocean acidification has been upheld in numerous studies, such as the 2009 Planktic Foraminiferal Shell Thinning in the Arabian Sea due to anthropogenic ocean acidification, the 2009 Reduced Calcification in Modern Southern Ocean Planktonic Foraminifera, and the 2014 The Role of Ocean Acidification in Emiliana Huxleyi Coccolith Thinning in the Mediterranean Sea. Additionally, climate change has evidently affected the amount of carbon dioxide taken up by phytoplankton, according to the 2006 paper, Climate Driven Trends in Contemporary Ocean Productivity. Since 1999, the amount of carbon dioxide fixed into organic materials, such as glucose, by phytoplankton has continually declined. As less carbon dioxide is consumed by these organisms, more is going to end up in both the atmosphere and oceans. Interestingly, though, Terrestrial plant productivity has apparently increased due to a lowering of critical climatic constraints. If only we could convince major corporations to slow down on deforestation. Returning to corals, reefs are also suffering from ocean acidification. They too are experiencing reduced calcification and are responding to it in different ways. For one, some corals, such as Porites and the Great Barrier Reef, are reducing their linear extension rates. Second, some corals are maintaining their growth rate by reducing their skeletal density, leading to more brittle corals. This can then lead to increased coral destruction by animals and storms, which will also result in reduced coastal protection. Third, some corals can retain both their growth rate and skeletal density by investing greater energy in calcification. According to that 2007 paper on coral reefs and ocean acidification noted earlier, 
quote, a likely side effect of this strategy is the diversion of resources from other essential processes such as reproduction, as seen in chronic stress, which could ultimately reduce the larval output from reefs and impair the potential for recolonization following disturbances, close quote. Next, Terrapoda is a possibly monophyletic clade of free-swimming sea snails and sea slugs, and experiments with increasing ocean acidification have shown that they are especially vulnerable to its effects. One 2011 study showed that both mortality and shell degradation increase significantly under more acidic conditions. Further, a 2017 study argued that, due to their sensitivity to ocean acidification, pteropods should be used as an indicator species of oceanic aragonite levels. Benthic mollusks, such as oysters and mussels, are also evidently sensitive to changes in seawater carbonate chemistry. Lastly, echinoderms have been affected by ocean acidification. The sea urchins Hemicentrotus and Echinodetra showed decreases in fertilization success, developmental rates, and larval size with decreasing ocean pH. Abnormal skeletogenesis was also observed. Now, understand that not all marine organisms will be negatively affected by ocean acidification. Some might even prosper from it. The same goes for global warming. Does that therefore mean we don't have to care about our environmental impacts? No, obviously not. Remember that fish populations, which we consume, are impacted by coral reef health, and species destruction by things like overfishing is a topic for another video. Regardless, many species will be impacted, at least some of which will certainly negatively impact us. So, many organisms are affected by ocean acidification, and remember, ocean acidification is, in turn, being caused by anthropogenic emissions. Global warming isn't the only effect of putting tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We need to be conscious of all of the carbon dioxide dissolving into the oceans. So, thanks for watching. And I'll see you next time.